Thank you so much for having me. So I am not a, a typographer, but I am working on an interactive pop-up book right now about type and technology. And um, so I, I guess I consider myself mostly a graphic designer, but I'm also a pop-up book author, an animator, a tinkerer. And in all of those things, I take an inordinate amount of pleasure in misusing technology to sort of figure out like what else we can do with it that's not its traditional purpose. Um, so this project, which we finished all of an hour ago, <laughs> is a really good example of this. So this is an animation that I printed yesterday at the Arm in Williamsburg um, from Resograft frames. So what I do is I print them out on the Rezo and then scan the back end and stitch them back together. And this was for the occasion of making an animated promo for Aglet Mono, which is the um, new the typeface I'm using throughout this presentation. Um, it was launched today by uh, XYZ Type, Ben Keel, and Jesse Reagan. And um, I'm including this in part because I, I, I want to include a tangent here. Uh, you know, New York City has been through a lot lately, but I think that the story really underscores like why New York City is such a magical place. Um, so about six years ago, um, after you know Jesse and Jesse and I already knew each other for a couple of years just through design circles, um, we ended up collaborating on a project for the New York Public Library. And this project got some acclaim and it got written up in the paper. And Jesse's stepmom noticed the paper and noticed that both of our names were in it. And I got this weird email from, from Jesse, who is consistently the, the most polite person I ever talked to. Um, <laughs> and he says, you know, I, you know, I hate to even ask you this. It's so weird. I don't want to make you feel strange, but are you, Kelly Anderson from Louisiana originally. And it turns out that my grandfather's brother's daughter is Jesse's stepmom. Uh, so as kids, we hung out on the same farm in the remote town of Kirthwood, Louisiana. Unfortunately, there's no photos of us together, but um, this is me and my sister and my grandfather um, and great grandfather. And um, yeah, Jesse and I totally drove around the same four-wheeler and careened around the same cow pat patties. Um, and we, you know, never would have met probably, <laughs> you know, if this magical city and this like wonderful community that we have here hadn't brought us together. Um, so yeah, that's what I've been doing these last two days. And while I was over at the arm um, printing on the Rezo, I also did a fast collaboration with Jason Yun. Um, he makes a lot of digital animations for Klim typography, and they they tend to be like really slick, really pristine, um, really beautiful, and therefore extremely fun to like mess up these pristine surfaces with Rezo noise. Um, so I'm working with Jason a little for a little while on these types of things, and I, I hope that we find out we're related too. But <laughs> I don't know how often that actually happens. So part of why I like figuring out how to misuse technology and get it to do something that it wasn't meant to do um, is because there's a lot of possibility um, hiding in our world in plain view. Um, you know, we pretty easily get complacent with the tools we use and kind of use them in the ways that are intended. And then the world ends up becoming a little bit more dutiful and dull. But within each obedient object or tool that we take for granted, um, there's this surreal side door, these rebellious possibilities waiting to be let out. And so um, my favorite thing to do in my work is to attempt extreme acts of transformation. Um, the more radical, the better. For example, this is um, turning a piece of paper, a material that's traditionally considered non-technological, and folding it so that it can replicate the function of a more complex technology of a camera. Um, this book is called, this book is a camera, and it is a working camera, and a book too. I'm the master of, of literal book titles. And it takes pretty good photos. Um, they are large format, so they're four inches by five inches. So there's a lot of information that gets on the paper. Um, and there's no depth of field because there's no lens. And so everything ends up 
kind of equally in focus. So we often don't think or talk about um, wonder as being like a, a, a force of subversion in the world, but um, I think that demonstrations like this have the potential to make a, a lasting and deep impact, um, especially when we're talking about uh, providing experiences for, for children. I think it encourages kids to like look at their world a little bit sideways. So this is my other published book. Um, this book is a planetarium and um, Again, disappointingly <laughs> literal title, it is a book, it has a tiny planetarium in it, um, and five other pop-ups that recreate functionality that we normally associate with technology. So um, it's able to create demonstrations of how sound works, how pitch works, how time works, um, light, and even it sort of explains the basics of encryption uh, and explains like how that becomes more complicated once you get into computer encryption systems. So this energy of, of finding and highlighting and being passionate about pursuing these invisible forces in the world um, used to almost exclusively go into designing infographics. So um, this is the work I did for many years. And this activity of um, data visualization is all about bringing facts from the abstract or numerical or invisible realm into the sphere of perception so that you can see those facts. So I thought, you know, as the next not logical step, what about feeling those facts too? Like, wouldn't it be better to see and feel and experience those facts and have this multi-sensory reinforcement of the reality that's in front of you? Um, what you're seeing here is a set of typographic origami tessellations um, that do that. They explain them, uh, their purpose, they diagram their function, and then also you presumably fold it and you can actually feel what it does. Um, and I, I'm really excited about this type of work because I, I think we intellectually think about the world uh, through our bodies and through touch and through friction and pressure and through these tinkering modalities. Um, I, I think it's downplayed like how uh, intellectual and how useful that kind of thought can be in discovering how things work. Um, you know, we're hardwired by evolution to have these, you know, very philosophical uh, exchanges with our things. And I think if you, you talk to any artist about their practice, you can sort of get a sense for that, um, designers too. So yeah, we, uh, me and you, we are awkwardly wedged in this purgatory between being physical, sensory, tactile uh, creatures um, with thousands of years of evolution of thinking that way and between this digital realm of information uh, and commands and data that we're having to parse. Which I, this is my, my best theory why I'm so smitten with this dumb machine. Um, I think I just like actually really commiserate it with being trapped in the same sort of uh, digital analog purgatory as I am. So uh, besides rezoing every piece of type that I've seen lately, this is the main project that I'm working on. I'm constructing um, type, collapsible type, into a pop-up book. Um, I've been prototyping this interactive pop-up ABC book with Letterform Archives uh, publishing program to demonstrate typographic concepts and philosophy to show how type has been impacted by culture, um, to show where letter forms get their shape. Um, and it's called Alphabet in Motion, a pop-up book for type of files. So um, this is a, a rough prototype. We don't know if pricing will allow us to make a cover like this, but I really, really want a cover like this. Um, so that's a possibility. It's also a possibility that it might be bright pink. So um, it's hard to, a little bit tricky to design for these three-dimensional projects because you really have to prototype it and test it out to even make decisions about the color contrast and like whether it's optically doing what it needs to do as soon as those little fronds separate. So um, I've been working on this for a very long time. So with this book, I have the interesting challenge of working kind of in the inverse direction <laughs> to the flow of this history that I'm depicting in the book. Um, because I'm creating 
mechanical, physical idioms. Um, let me see if I can get that to play. Yeah, mechanical, physical idioms for what's happening in type technology, which has progressively become flatter, more 2D, more of a digital experience, um, increasingly moving away from the mechanical. Um, but, you know, as I mentioned, like, human beings, they remain physical. So these physical metaphors are often very useful. Um, this is an alternate cover prototype that, uh, you know, we rejected because it's too fussy, but I, it's a fun way, I think, of creating a physical analog for that expansive and contracting feeling of um, variable type and parametric type on, on sliders, of course, which, you know, we all think of sliders as uh, being in apps, but they originally came from sliders in the real world. So it's just this funny sort of like back and forth between those worlds. Uh, here is an ABC animation I made to uh, begin promoting the book and this title of Alphabet in Motion. So this is a nod to the fact that uh, the book consists of animated pop-ups that everything the book literally moves um, and you can tinker with it, but it's also a nod to the content, uh, that the alphabet is always in flux. And the essays um, that I'm in the middle of writing now for the book reinforce this notion that type is almost an you know, impossibly condensed microscopic representation of an always changing culture. You can witness changes that happen in the world um, are also happening in type at this teeny tiny scale. So it's like a really cool, like compressed, small representation of, of zeitgeist. Uh, these technological changes, changes in uh, philosophy and the history of ideas, uh, changes in what we think the future looks like, what we want the future to be, changes in art. Um, you know, all of these specific cultural moments produce specific meanings and feelings and attitude that uh, end up getting reflected in type in these really interesting ways. So, um, I want the book to answer questions like this. Um, you know, when I see warped, distorted, projected type, you know, why, why does that remind me of psychedelia? Why does it remind me of the 60s? Um, and, you know, for, for example, this proposed spread is going to be all about the aesthetics of uh, light projection. Uh, so all about these 2D shapes that fall and drape across uh, 3D surfaces. Um, and this works just like with, a, with an iPhone. Uh, I'm using Amelia as my little sample phototype projection, uh, but it's going to come with like a couple different fonts from this area. And you can create like a mini version of uh, Joshua Light Show in your bathroom, or if you prefer, uh, the plastic exploding inevitable with a velvet underground, or even uh, Brian Ginson's uh, turntable meditation device, uh, the dream machine. So this thread is really all about uh, letting the reader play with the basic mechanisms of photo lettering and understand those concepts and understand why type starts being warped, uh, why it starts bubbling. Um, and so, uh, you know, photo lettering at this time had developed as an alternative to metal type and offered all of these new experimental possibilities. Um, this is this is a book that I saw at the uh, the at Letterform Archive. It's called Psychedelic Types. Um, this is called a kaleidograph. It's a type of photo lettering. There's many different devices um, for photo lettering, um, but this is all uh, all of these typefaces are, are designed by Ed uh, Bengat. And this is another rough prototype um, about another zeitgeisty thing is, you know, why do certain typefaces like uh, Eurostilly um, and this hand-drawn version, really crummy hand-drawn version that I did of uh, General Types Palat, why do they feel so mod? Um, this is an R that's created out of 16 little spinning disks that rotate uh, 90 degrees each. My brain was sort of like, one step into After Effects, one step into paper. 
And this is how it works. It's just these really simple array of V folds. Um, and you know, every time you open and close the book, they go ahead and they rotate 90 degrees. Um, so yeah, this is, this is totally how it works behind the scenes. There's not much to this, just kind of crazy. Um, the, depending on which way they face, whether they face up or down, that will give you your angle of rotation here. And then finally, a circle is glued, which after I built this entire thing, I realized that obviously, obviously they need to be uh, super ellipses. <laughs> because the answer to why this R feels so mod, um, like why Anagramma feels so super mod, you know, on the dashboards um, in 2001, A Space Odyssey, um, is mostly attributable to the, attributable to the fact that these, these letter forms themselves are, are built upon the shape of super ellipse. which is a shape that came on strong and uh, went out of vogue pretty quickly, um, but is forever associated with the 60s. So um, the super ellipse is this post-World War II invention, which isn't quite organic, isn't quite geometric, um, but actually you know, it requires a certain level of uh, manufacturing precision to be able to make uh, a, a shape like this. And so it, it came as soon as it was possible, basically. And the super ellipse was uh, first discovered, if you can say that, it was first identified and named by uh, the Danish poet uh, Piet Hein in his 1959 winning proposal for the redesign of a roundabout in Stockholm. Um, he uh, discussed quite poetically about the aesthetic power and meaning of this shape, um, which I'm just going to go ahead and, and read this description as I go through a couple of different uh, designs of super ellipses. So he says, in the whole pattern of civilization, there have been two tendencies, one towards straight lines and rectangular patterns and one towards circular lines. There are reasons, mechanical and psychological, for both tendencies. Things made with straight lines fit well together and save space, and we can move easily, physically or mentally, around things made with round lines. This shape, it isn't fixed. It isn't definite, like a circle or a square. You don't know what it is. It isn't aesthetically satisfying. The super ellipse solved the problem. It is neither round nor rectangular, but somewhere in between. It is a fixed, definite shape. It has unity. This is actually a super elliptical toy that he made. Um, yeah, but we see it appearing in um, all kinds of different typefaces. And this is uh, just sort of showing how this uh, falls on the super elliptical grid. And perhaps the most famous uh, appearance of the super ellipse uh, was in 1968, when negotiations in Paris for uh, Vietnam, Vietnam War, they could not agree on whether to use a square table or a round table. Um, so eventually a super elliptical table was fabricated uh, as sort of like a physical, analog representation of a compromise between these two opposing geometric tendencies. So I'm running out of time, but I'm just going to show you a, a couple more just really quickly. Um, this is my O, and um, this is accompanied by an essay all about the, the Lost of Vegas, Vegas Strip, um, the different mechanical signs there. Um, uh, Betty Willis, who uh, designed uh, some of the most famous signs on the strip. And um, this is a, a slice form pop-up um, featuring a G by Wim Corral. And uh, this is accompanied by an essay where it, it just wholly focused on the idea of using a grid, um, but not following the rules. So using the grid as sort of like a creative jumping off point for experimentation, which I think of him as sort of uh, one of the, the patron saints of, of that concept. Yeah, there he is. <laughs> I haven't quite decided on the cover yet, but uh, it does work and it pops up and it pops down, so. Pretty good. Um, okay, so I think I'm almost out of time, 
but uh, I, I went ahead and um, the, the book, I, we think it, the Kickstarter might launch later this year, but we're not sure because there's a lot of technical challenges um, still to solve. So um, on my book page, kellyanderson.books, I just put a link to my newsletter. And um, yeah, we're, we're all going to announce it there. So uh, if you're interested, I don't know. I'm super excited about this. Uh, go there. <laughs> Thanks.